These days, it's funny to think that at one point, there was actually a slot in many computers dedicated just to graphics cards. I'm talking, of course, about the accelerated graphics port, or AGP interface. Before PCI Express took over pretty much everything in terms of PC expansion needs, AGP was a way of getting high-speed graphics into the home PC without the need for changing the wide-reaching standard used by all other expansion devices available at the time. This was the de facto interface for high-end graphics for around eight years, excluding later non-native bridged cards. That's a relatively short period in computing history if you really think about it. So what brought about the need for such a specialized interface? What did it offer that other slot types of the time couldn't? And why was it eventually replaced? Today, we're going to break down the history of AGP. This is Pixel Pipes. Before AGP, there was PCI. Since its introduction in 1992, the PCI bus has been a lauded advancement over its predecessor, ISA. ISA, or Industry Standard Architecture, had its roots going all the way back to the original IBM 5150, and had transitioned from 8-bit to 16-bit, and finally 32-bit with the addition of the VLB expansion bus. Each time, the physical ISA slot would get longer and longer, and in the case of VLB, could take up almost the entire width of your motherboard. PCI was basically the VLB bus condensed to a much smaller footprint, which meant it could accommodate a much wider range of devices and build environments. But it too had its technical limitations. The bus ran at 33 MHz in its original configuration, which was meant to sync up perfectly with the 33 MHz system bus that most computers of the early 90s ran at. This meant your peripherals, your memory, your chipset, front side bus, and even your CPU ran at the same clock speed or multiples thereof, which greatly simplified engineering. That might have been fast in the early 90s, but if it didn't make any significant advances, it was soon to be outdated in the coming years with breakneck improvements in PC processing power. For that reason, PCI was actually intended to grow and advance over time, and there were indeed 66 MHz versions made available starting with PCI 2.1, but with few consumer motherboards and devices supporting it, 33 MHz PCI remained the standard throughout the decades for the home PC, leaving only workstations to see true advancements like PCI X 1.0 and 2.0. While PCI remained relatively static, graphics performance was increasing by leaps and bounds. PCI's theoretical throughput in its base configuration was 133 megabytes per second, which was plenty for most devices and even cutting edge graphics cards would be hard pressed to saturate that for a handful of years. The problem was that PCI shared that bandwidth across all connected devices, and as time went on, that would include many integrated components on the motherboard, such as ethernet, audio, and IDE controllers. The idea for a dedicated interface just for graphics was actually introduced by Intel in 1997. This made sense, as while they weren't known for graphics at that time, Intel was considered the world leader of CPUs for many years. And because they manufactured their own chipsets, they were often relied upon for establishing new standards. After all, they were the ones that developed PCI. AGP isn't actually all that different from PCI in terms of architecture. It does include a number of important changes, however, like giving the graphics card its own dedicated connection to the chipset and CPU, allowing exclusive use of its bandwidth. The other big improvement is sideband addressing, which while not required in the first couple revisions of AGP, allows bidirectional commands and addressing with a separate 8-bit sideband bus, basically letting commands to be issued even while data is filling the other 32 address lines. You also have AGP texturing, which uses DMA to allow a graphics card to use allocated space in system RAM, also known as the AGP aperture setting, for swapping textures in cases when onboard memory on the card is inadequate. This was a feature used heavily by Intel on their first discrete graphics card, the i740, and they touted it as a speed enhancement, but it quickly became clear that fetching textures from system memory was not good for performance, instead causing tremendous slowdown. And then, of course, there's the bandwidth improvement. Even the base AGP 1X interface is faster than the standard 33 MHz PCI at 266 megabytes per second. But of course, AGP would see faster revisions later on. 
AGP was actually introduced at 2x speed, which means twice the number of transfers per clock cycle at 66 MHz, resulting in 533 megabytes per second. While the clock speed would remain the same, the number of transfers per clock would increase from 4x to 8x, the latter of which would wind up being the final speed revision. The speed increases coincided with newer AGP specifications, with 4X AGP being AGP 2.0, introduced in 1999, and 8X AGP being AGP 3.0, introduced in 2002. The specifications also changed the signal voltage, going from its original 3.3 volts with AGP 1.0 to 1.5 volts with 2.0 and 0.8 volts specified for 3.0. Different revisions resulted in slightly different slot designs, with notches in a slot, also known as keys, denoting the revision your slot supported. Only two keys were implemented, one with a notch closer to the card bracket for 3.3 volt cards, another with a key towards the rear for 1.5 volt cards. None were made for 0.8 volts, and it's widely believed that 0.8 volts was never properly implemented in consumer systems. Another improvement introduced with AGP 2.0 was fast writes, which allowed data to be written directly to the graphics card without having to be copied first to the system memory. Many board manufacturers during the start of the millennium got around the slot key confusion with what's known as universal AGP, which was just an open slot with no keys that could accept either 3.3 volt or 1.5 volt cards interchangeably. This was handy for those that wanted to use 2X AGP exclusive cards, such as 3DFX's Voodoo line, but wanted to upgrade to 4X AGP cards later on. Universal AGP largely disappeared once 8X AGP took over. Beyond that, there are the less common connector types. There's AGP Pro, which supplies additional pins to allow for more power to the card, and as the name implies, it was generally intended for professional workstation machines. For the consumer market, graphics cards needing additional power usually opted to simply include an extra power connector, either a Molex or floppy connector, with the very last AGP cards sometimes even using a PCI Express or PEG connector. Similar to AGP Pro, Apple created a proprietary version of AGP for their PowerMac series, which included an additional power connector nearer to the bracket, negating the need for external power. You can see examples of that here with the Apple version of the Radeon 9800 Pro and G4 6800 Ultra. One trait all AGP connectors had, however, was the odd interlocking tooth design of the edge connector pins. This was recycled from Intel's Slot 1 design for their CPUs and allowed for more pins to be condensed into a lower profile connector, but came with a serious drawback. Because the slot itself mirrored these interlocking pins, if you didn't fully insert your card firmly and completely, you could accidentally connect the wrong edge pins with the wrong slot pins, likely causing a short in the graphics card or motherboard. Straight pin connectors like PCI or PCI Express didn't have nearly as much risk of crosswire faults and could in theory run without a complete insertion. Throughout all my testing of many different graphics cards, I've had one instance of a PCB short caused by switching on a system when a card was not fully inserted, and it's not fun to have to deal with. To help prevent this, motherboards with newer AGP revisions included a locking mechanism of some sort so you knew without having to look if you put it in right, and to help ensure it remained that way even if the system was jostled around. AGP's dominance would grow over time. While it began life only really being necessary for top-of-the-line graphics cards, performance of mid-range and even budget cards quickly grew to the point where PCI was simply too slow to bring out the best that those GPUs were capable of. The speed improvements became compulsory, and while I'd love to explain in further detail why it made better use of clock cycles or what the specific purpose of each pin was, I'm neither knowledgeable enough or uh, particularly interested enough in lengthening this video out to such an exhausted degree. At this point, I think most of you get the general idea. While AGP could have undoubtedly continued even further, a certain point-to-point -point serial interface was lurking on the horizon that promised to not just increase the throughput performance for graphics cards, but all other devices on the PC, even allowing for multiple graphics cards to work together simultaneously. Such insanity! AGP would continue to cling onto the market even after the introduction of PCI Express, at least for a while. A number of PCI Express cards were brought over to AGP using bridge chips which translated signals between the different protocols. There were even fake AGP slots on motherboards that only supported PCI Express, with highly legitimate sounding names like AGP Express, AGX, AGI, XGP, FGE, and AGR, but 
None of them work like a traditional AGP slot, often relying on the older PCI bus with a few at least clocking them up to 66 MHz, although it still killed performance. But now that we've covered the history, I'm sure many of you are eager to see a breakdown of what the actual performance difference is like in games. Like for instance, what would happen if I tested AGP against PCI Express using the fastest available cards? But if you've looked at the progress bar below, you'll no doubt have realized that we've run out of time for this video. As such a video is on the to-do list, I just have to get the right assortment of motherboards for testing. In the meantime, I hope you enjoyed this little history lesson of sorts, and until we meet again, thanks for watching, I'm Nathan, and this has been Pixel Pipes. Mm -hmm.